Hey everybody, welcome to Ecom Buster's videos. We're gonna do the production possibilities frontier. We're gonna do a whole lot in this video because we're gonna try to knock out every concept in a single video. And the reason being, really, it's the production possibility frontier. It's pretty straightforward, okay? Uh, you should not be getting too overwhelmed by it. First thing I wanna say is, yes, we call it the production possibility frontier. Lots of textbooks call it the production possibility curve. It's the same thing. So whether you call it the PPC or the PPF, same thing, we just like the word frontier a lot better than curve here at Econ Busters. Anyhow, let's first start with just the term, okay? The term I like to kind of focus on because terms have meaning in economics, and a lot of kids, they get about a month into the year and they can't even remember what this thing's called, so let's just take a second to make sure that we've got it. The first thing is the production. So the first big word, production, that's what it's looking at. It's looking at the production of two different goods. We're going with the two most common goods put onto a PPF, guns and butter. And I think that's the best you know, goods to put on a curve. A lot of authors are going with different things these days, but the traditional or classic way to do a PPF is to simply put guns and butter. Why? Because one of the few times that a country has a decision between making two groups of goods, and by the way, these are kind of groups, this being for military and this being for food or calories, these, the only time like a country gets into a position that they really are just choosing between two groups of goods, specifically these two groups of goods, is if they're at a war. If they're fighting, let's say, a total war, then a country really is got a decision between two different groups of goods, and these are the ones that they're trying to decide between making. They're either going to make military goods or they're going to make food. That's it, because they're fighting a war that is an existential threat to them. And so it's the classic to put up here because it kind of makes the stylized example kind of have meaning. The stylized example being, once again, you're making two separate goods and that's all you're making. So let's go back to this, the production. We're focused on producing goods and services, production of guns or butters. Possibilities, okay? Possibilities is not focused on uh, the you know producing inside or on the curve. It's saying possibilities is there is an infinite combination of guns and butters that we can make. These are this curve right here shows us all the different possible combinations of the two goods that we are making. So we have choices that we have to make. And then finally, frontier, that there is a maximum that we can make in the present. And that's what's key, is this frontier is saying with fixed resources, and that's what you have in the present, okay? Perhaps in the future you'll get more resources, but in the present, you've got a certain amount, a finite amount of resources, and there is a frontier, a maximum of goods and services that you can produce. So you are bounded in the present by this line. You can't produce out here in the present. Now, you might be able to consume out here with trade, okay? But you cannot, in the present, produce out here. Perhaps you'll be able to produce out here in the future with economic growth, but not in the present. And also, you can definitely produce within your frontier, but that's going to be problematic, as we'll see in just a second. So, here we go. Guns, butter, a production possibility frontier. Let's first kind of focus on these numbers that are up here because I want to focus on this shape of this line. It's called concave to the origin. Okay, and it shows us a law, the law of increasing opportunity costs. So I just went ahead and put some numbers up here. I just kind of divided my butter into three units. Okay, whatever those units might be. Maybe they're uh, 10 million calories, whatever we want to say, but there's we've divided them up into three units and on guns, I've divided all the production of guns into three units too, whatever a unit might be, which would be a whole lot of military goods, okay? So, let's first just say we make zero butter. If we made zero butter, how many guns could we make? We could make three. We could be right there. But then we decide, heck, that's so good, we're all going to starve to death. We need to make some butter. We need to make some calories. So we decide to make the first unit of butter. And when we make the first unit of butter, we give up... 0.2 units of guns. We make that first unit of butter. This is where we're going to now be. And so we went from that dot to that dot. We lost 0.2 units of guns. So we would say the opportunity cost of the first unit of butter is 0.2 units of guns. Then we say, you know what? That's still not enough calories. We want a little bit more calories. So we decide to go ahead and make the second 
unit of butter. And I really want to focus on the word second, okay? Now, I'm not looking at making two. I want to look at the making the second, okay? Economics, we look at marginal analysis. We look at increments of one. So what is the cost of making the second going from one to two? So we're going to go from this dot to this dot. We're going to go from uh, 2.8 guns to two guns. So what is the cost? The cost is going to be 0.8 guns. Once again, to be clear, what is the cost of making the second unit of butter? It's 0.8 guns. And then, I don't know, peace breaks out. We don't want any guns anymore. So we decide we're not going to make any guns. We're going to make all butter. So we're going to make that third unit of butter. So what is the cost of making the third unit of butter? Going from the second to the third. Red dot goes from there to there. Well, that's going to be incredibly costly. The cost is going to be two units of guns. So once again, the shape of this curve, concave to the origin, shows us the law of increasing opportunity cost. And here we are, as we went from 1.2 to the second, 0.8 to the third, 2, we saw the uh, opportunity cost increase. And let's just talk for a moment why that is, okay? So for us to understand that, I'm going to draw a little blob right there and we say that's all of our resources, if you will, our land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurial ability, our four factors of production, all of those factors of production right in there, okay? Well, if we were, going back to this dot, making this dot right here, all guns, no butter, let's, let's just imagine we allocated all of our resources to right there. That's what we'd have to do to get to this point. But then we decide we want that first unit of butter. Well, what would we do at this point? What we'd do is we'd take the resources here that were really good at making butter and pretty doggone bad at making guns, and we would divert those resources away from gun to butter production. And that's why our cost would be quite low, because once again, we'd find the resources that were good at making butter and bad at making guns. But then, if we wanted to go from this dot, making the first unit of butter, to the second unit of butter, and you notice the cost went up. Why is that? Well, we've already taken the resources that were from this blob that were great at butter and bad at guns, and so we can't do that anymore. So now we're going to have to go out after resources that are just pretty good at making butter and not so good at making guns. And so that opportunity cost went up. And then if you go from this dot right here to that dot, when you go to make the third unit of butter, why is the cost even increasing more? Because now the only resources that you have not diverted from guns to butter are resources that are actually pretty hug on good at making guns and pretty bad at making butter. And so it's going to be quite costly to make the third unit of butter. And once again, that is the law of increasing opportunity costs, and it's one of the main things that the PPF is showing us. Now, like I said, we're going to do all of this in one video. It's a long video. We're going to get all the main points out. So let's move on to the next main thing that a PPF is showing us. Now, I want to go back and focus on these red dots right here. I'm going to put a few more red dots in there. And I'm going to point at all the red dots real quick and say, hey, all of these are possible. Going back to that word, all those dots are possible. And all those dots would represent an efficient use of resources from a production standpoint. Hence the term production efficiency, okay? So we would be productively efficient on all these points, which means using resources in their lowest costly manner. The way that I like to think about it is to be at any of these dots that's on the curve, we allocated just the perfect resources to one good and the other good given the constraint of producing at that line. So we produced in the least costly way. We were able to take the resources that we should take to make butter and the resources we should take to, should take to make guns and we didn't mess up at all when we did that. So all these are possible. They're all productively efficient and we would also assume full user, uh, full usage of resources, okay? So I'll, sometimes you'll hear just kind of like full employment. However, society would not be equally well off at all of these dots. There is only one dot where society is best off, okay? And I'm just going to pick a random dot, not to say this is the way it is, but I'm going to say that dot right there is where society is best off, okay? Once again, not saying that's actually the place, just picking one dot, and that is the point of allocative 
efficiency. This is where societal surplus is maximized, okay? So when it comes to all the dots, they're all productively efficient, but society is not equally happy at all dots. There is only one dot in which societal happiness or societal surplus is maximized. There it is. That's the point of allocative efficiency. And if we were right there, we were productively efficient, don't get me wrong, but we also every good that we made and for this situation there's only two goods guns and butter <coughs> excuse me for every good we made these two goods marginal benefit equal marginal cost for the last unit produced of each one of them so there we go point of allocative efficiency if we ended up inside the curve what would that mean if we were not right there inside the curve it means we were either productively any Okay, that'd be one reason. Or we weren't fully deploying our resources. We had resources that were idle. From a macro class, we might point at that dot and say, hey, we have cyclical unemployment, which would be idle labor, labor that's willing um, and able to work and is actually seeking work, um, but has been laid off because of cyclical downturns in the economy. So once again, this dot, either productively inefficient and or uh, not fully employing all our resources in a macro class, you'll often associate this with cyclical unemployment. Now let's go out to this dot right there, okay? That dot, like I said, not possible to produce there in the present. That's very important that we never mess that up, okay? We cannot produce there in the, in the present. Might be able to consume there, like I said earlier, with trade, but not be able to produce there. However, if we were able to produce out there in the future, that would represent economic growth. And by the way, if we ever are able to produce out there in the future, it's probably because our PPF, our entire curve, has shifted out. And this shifting out of the curve represents economic growth. So now we've got to talk about how do you get economic growth. Well, it's an increase in either the quantity or the quality of your four factors of production. So let's go through that really quickly. Land, okay, labor, capital, which is your machinery and your plants, entrepreneurial ability. And like I said, it's Q and Q. And what do the Q stand for? Quality and quantity. So either the quality or quantity of your land, oftentimes it's the quality of your land, hard to increase, increase the quantity, but you can if you take into account like clearing land out. Labor definitely can increase both quantity and quality. Uh, quality would be education and training, i.e. increasing your human capital. So improvements in human capital would be a quality improvement of labor. A lot of courses will fo focus on that. Uh, the quantity of capital, your plant mach machinery, or the quality. And how do you improve the quality of your capital? Well, that's technology, okay? So of course, technological, in, uh, uh, technological improvements would shift you out and it comes through a quality change in your capital and then entrepreneurial ability that's your risk taking so how do you improve your risk taking there's different ways i mean you could have um people actually teach like colleges teach entrepreneurial classes and a lot of them are but i think the biggest thing to focus on is once again entrepreneurial ability is the ability to take risk and that's oftentimes associated with people getting to retain the fruits of their labor so creating incentives in, in society that makes it so entrepreneurs want to take risk and once again that comes along with getting to retain the fruits of your labor so this dot right here representing economic growth we can only get there in the future so that's all the main points of a ppf like i said it's a very general concept um, hopefully we covered anything that you might have a little bit of problem with we'll see you in the next video thanks for tuning in